Welcome everybody, good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, panel discussion on how best to stimulate the production and uh, diffusion, dissemination of uh, works of art, of cultural works. Um, we have three people in the panel that will uh, will discuss this issue uh, with each other as well as with you. Um, before they uh, start a discussion, they will um, elaborate upon their own position in a couple of minutes. Um, they will introduce themselves, then elaborate on their, uh, on their position. Um, each of these does that, and then uh, there will be some clarification issues, uh, time for that. Uh, then the discussion starts by um, um, discussion amongst them. But um, I would very much like to uh, also ask you if you uh, have questions or issues uh, that you'd like to raise to, uh, to do so. Indicate this to me. There's a mic over there um, and you can raise your issues or questions. Um, and the only thing that uh, I would like uh, to ask is to abide by two rules um, that I would like to, uh, to have uh, this afternoon. One is, one rule is to always be polite. Uh, the only person that uh, is uh, allowed not to be polite is myself. Um, the organizers have asked me to uh, behave as a kind of god, and I will do so. So if somebody is not polite, I will, I will ask for uh, that interruption, that intervention to be, uh, to be cut. Okay, that's rule number one. Rule number two is not to be too technical. Um, both both uh, in legal terms as well as in, uh, in IT or technical terms. So not, do not um, use uh, too technical language, too technical arguments. Now before I turn, um, um, so, so I will um, allow the, uh, the speakers of the panel to introduce themselves 
And if you want to um, address uh, me with a question, uh, my name is Wilfred, Wilfred Dolsma, uh, and I'm a professor of innovation studies at the University of Groningen. So address me as Wilfred and that's going to be fine. Uh, I think that's polite enough. Okay, so um, three minutes each for the three panelists and we'll start with uh, Tim Kuyk. Tim, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, my name is Tim Kuyk. I'm uh, the director of a foundation which is named Brain. Um, thank you. Um, We do, uh, thank you, we do copyright enforcement, um, meaning that what we believe is that if you create something, you've got something, uh, but you can only really exploit that something if you can protect it, and the protection is what we do. We don't really mind whether you give your work away or whether you charge for it or whatever model you use, it's your decision and not somebody else's. Uh, so that's what we stand for, uh, and that's what we do. I mean, I was on holiday, like many of you. I was sitting on a terrace, and um, a guy came up to me, and he was selling uh, DVDs. And lo and behold, they were not legal copies. So I said, no, thank you. And he said, no, but they're the latest films. Why don't you want them? And I said, well, I work for the creative industry, I work for filmmakers, and he said, oh, you're in the business too. <laughs> so that's what we're up against. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Walter van Holst. In uh, daily life, I'm an IT lawyer. Uh, I also happen to be a volunteer at uh, Vrijschrift, which is uh, Scriptum Libre for the Dutch impaired among you. And uh, Scriptum Libre is about the uh, preservation and uh, creation and sharing of culture and that also involves the preservation of the public domain, uh, the creation of new common material such as um, Scriptum Libre has been involved in the Dutch version of OpenStreetMaps. Uh, we've also been involved in lobbying against software patents. Quite a few of our people are uh, heavily involved in the Gutenberg project more low-key, we've been lobbying against extension of the performing rights. Uh, so that's more or less uh, what we do. And our position is that the creation of new material um, is highly dependent on access to existing material, whether it's really old material, fairly recent. And we feel that the, uh, that a draconian enforcement of copyright in its current form is more of an impediment to the creation of new material than the wholesale infringement of copyright as it is going on right now. Uh, and basically we are uh, in favor of a thorough uh, reconstruction of uh, intellectual rights such as a reduction of the term of copyright, abolishment of database rights and abolishment of patent law. Thank you. Uh, my name is Arjen Kamphuis. Normally I work in um, uh, open source lobbying and IT things and uh, picking uh, sides in a fight like this is a sort of a hobby that got a bit out of hand. Um, my position on copyright is, is that it's a really cool idea but the current implementation seriously sucks. Um, <laughs> human beings have been making culture in all kinds of ways for about 15,000 years. And about for 100 years, we've been putting some of that on little plastic discs or tapes. That 100 years was the 20th century, and it's now over. Um, so now I think we can uh, move beyond uh, uh, some of those uh, uh, models. Um, and uh, just like with the last five other switches from one sort of technology to another, so we had the piano player in the 1890s, where then the musicians started saying, oh, this technology will destroy us. And of course, more music was made, and then 
uh, the music was put into records and other people became very upset because that was destroying their business model. And then other people started playing those records on the radio and then the people who made the records got very upset and so on and so on. And we went through VHS video recorders and MP3 technology and now we are in you know, little hard disks and smart cards. Um, and what we see every time basically is that there are a bunch of people who have grown really uh, fat and wealthy of the existing situation who will then defend that existing situation even when it has basically passed. And my personal position is um, I never watch broadcast anything anymore, yet I don't miss anything and I have a home network with a couple of terabytes of um, stuff, all of which I own legally, by the way, because of the Dutch situation where I can download legally as long as I don't trade it. So that's my personal view on it. <laughs> Okay, thank you uh, uh, for your elaboration of your position. Um, is there anything that you want to add at this point? Okay, let's, um, as far as I'm concerned, there's, uh, there's plenty of things uh, to discuss. Uh, uh, let me add uh, uh, one bit uh, based upon your introduction. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, Walter, you say you want to reconstruct um, can you be a little bit more concrete? Yeah. Uh, what do you want to reconstruct and how do you want to reconstruct? Uh, for, for starters, I would be in favor of a reduction of the term of copyright to maybe around 15 years, maybe with the possibility to extend it through registration, which is completely uh, opposite of what the Berner Convention says since 1883, I think. Uh, another thing is uh, there's a lot of distinctions made between various kinds of work, like software, software is treated in a really weird way in copyright law which makes it in fact impossible to criticize or to quote software. I would like to make the copyright protection of software dependent on the publication of the source code, uh, for example. And uh, I would also like to fix uh, the really poor situation authors are in when uh, negotiating contracts with the distributors. Thank you. Um, another thing is, uh, you, um, uh, Arjen, you said that uh, copyright is a good idea, but the implementation sucks. Um, can you give a concrete example of uh, what, in your eyes, sucks most? Um, I think that because of um, uh, sort of the power imbalance between large uh, content companies who've had, you know, a century to build up capital and big organizations and, and teams of lawyers versus individual artists who tend to be uh, young, poor, and uneducated in the ways of the law. So there's a massive power imbalance there, combined with uh, copyright extensions that have, are sort of moving in the direction of in eternity minus a day, when originally it was 14 years, um, in, in an age when things moved a lot slower than today. Uh, so I think those two aspects combine to make a, a situation where um, it seems that the law is now serving a limited number of companies and no longer serves us. And I think that's always a good point where you have to say as a society, well, either you know, we're going to change the law the nice way through our parliaments, or we're going to change the law the not so nice way, but just being massively civil disobedient, and then at some point the whole system will fail. Um, and I, I'd, I'd like to do the first thing, which I think is a bit more sort of orderly and leads to less arrests and all kinds of other you know, unhappiness. Uh, but if necessary, then we'll take the second round. Okay, that's a threat. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you to right. respond to that, yes. No, yeah, okay. Um, what I think is that copyright is good for the, for the small independent uh, creator. Um, and if you feel that there are large corporations that are uh, abusing copyright. Uh, I think, in essence, copyright gives the individual creator the power to negotiate with large corporations. Um, if, you, if you feel there's an imbalance there, you need to address that not by diminishing the right of that individual creator, but by anti-competition regulation and perhaps a contract law uh, for um, uh, the, at the moment, uh, there is in development in the Netherlands a model contract law 
for copyright, which basically seeks to address the balance between individual creators and large corporations. And what about the length? Maybe that's also an issue that uh, you... Well, again, there, you know, if you look at the Internet, you know, one of the theories is that the Internet uh, can seek profitability uh, for creation through the long tail. Now, if you have to have a long tail, you need to have long protection. So, you know, there is, you need to find a balance for sure. But again, the individual creator that wishes to live from his creations needs, you know, a long protection. I don't know whether 15 years would be enough. Well, I, th I think there should be a balance between the interests of uh, society as a whole. Uh, I think we've seen a bunch of fairly solid studies from places like Oxford that says sort of the societal economic optimum for copyright is something in the order of 10 years. And it might be a bit more for certain things and a bit less for other things, but that's sort of a number that keeps coming up. Um, I think it would be a good idea to sort of to go there with the possibility to lengthen it maybe for individual authors, authors if they so choose. Um, but right now we have an existing situation where literally a handful of companies has sewn up uh, pretty much you know, a large part of the global cultural heritage and is holding on to it for, for literally decades. While they themselves actually came about by uh, not you know, following copyrights and patents. I mean, the reason Hollywood is on the west coast is because it was 3,000 miles away from the east coast where Mr. Edison had a bunch of patents. So everybody went west, screwed Edison over his patents, you know, and then they built a film industry based on that. And we all watch that stuff now. So it's a bit funny that those same people are now, you know, uh, calling us pirates. Um, I think they're, you know, those are the people in Somalia. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I've never, you know, entered a ship on sea that way, you know, with a, an AK-47 or anything. So, but, but it seems to be strange to me that while many countries and corporations actually thank their existence in, in, and their current success based on not sticking to those rules which I, they now ask us to stick to, it makes it a bit, I don't know, I don't feel a lot of sympathy for them when they say that, you know, they're having a hard time or anything. It makes it a bit sort of difficult. Okay, you want to... I don't know whether that's true. I mean, I think people, uh, filmmakers went to uh, Los Angeles because of the light, you know, and the good weather. <laughs> what it, what is also these, true. They didn't have these lamps in the beginning, they needed good light. What is also true is that uh, U.S. Uh, citizens were not allowed to pay license fees on the copyrighted material uh, to foreigners uh, up until the, the 1960s. Uh, I don't know the exact date, but anyway. Walter. I'd like to respond to Tim's remark uh, that, well, the proper way to change copyright law is not through willful downloading. And I'm going to make a very unpopular statement given the amount of Pirate Bay shirts in the audience. I won't shed a tear about the Pirate Bay. Having said that, uh, the Pirate Bay is useful for, because it proves that there is a problem. And I, don't, I think Tim is completely wrong about saying that, well, they have the normal lawmaking process. The lawmaking process is hijacked by special interest groups, and you have a very diffuse common interest, which is not represented in a good way in our current democratic system. And I'm not claiming that we should burn down democracy, on the contrary, but especially when you look at the, again, extension and extension on top of performing rights and copyright law, uh, copyrights, you see that every time you see the small group which has a vested interest, and especially the distributors and not the creators, um, push through changes in the law because there's no real genuine pushback from, more, from a common interest perspective. And only the recent case of the software patents which are proposed in the European level, I think it's a pretty uh, exceptional case where people push back on, the, on that front. Tim, you want to respond to that before we go to the audience? Um, yeah, I had a thought about that, but it's sort of... You don't have to. You um, don't ha you, sorry? You can, maybe you can, if you want to think it over a little bit, you can, you can respond to that later. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's, let's open up the floor to the audience. I've already uh, seen a number of hands uh, coming up. Um, please move to the microphone. There's a microphone in the middle. Um, and uh, remember, be concise, but also be polite. Okay, go, go, go ahead. 
Well, I have a funny example uh, of uh, the interests of corporations represented in copyright law. Uh, you know some quite popular songs from the 50s, which have been recycled numbers of times, uh, are now threatened or at risk of becoming public, uh, public domain. So, what do the large corporations do? Um, they're not going to land back and say, well, we accept defeat, it's now public domain. No, they sent armies of lobbyists to Europe and uh, our national uh, government to extend the, the copyright law, to extend the, the time it's all projected. That, that's the way commercial company, that's the way uh, corporations work. Uh, uh, we as the people are no longer uh, represented and, by the copyright law. It's and your point law. is that will not stimulate creation of new work uh, no, by these not. people who have created that in the 1950s or 60s. Um, uh, no, not at okay. all. It's yeah? just in the interest of corporations, not our interest. Well, yeah, okay, but, but remember, copyright also has the purpose of um, protecting those who invest in the production of something which is newly created. But, okay, you want to respond to that? Yeah. Arjen? Um, first, Arjen, no, then, then Tim. Yeah? Uh, well, I mean, since in Europe, most of, you know, most of the countries are still nominally democracies, um, I think we do get a little bit of sort of the government we deserve. If, if all of us together, you know, download the hell out of our DSL line, but don't write a, an email every now and then to our representatives in Brussels, then yes, we're going to get screwed over by lobbyists. I mean, the funny thing is there's many more of us, and we're smarter, of course, yet we keep losing. So obviously we're doing something wrong. Money, um, maybe? If, if, if there, there are more people in most European countries that have downloaded music or other content uh, than have voted for the current prime ministers of those countries. So why aren't they listening? Well, mostly because we're not saying anything. And but, so maybe if we would, you know, do, while you're downloading that stuff, I mean, the thing, you know, it takes a while anyway, still. Um, <laughs> take some time out and write a courteous email to your member of uh, parliament in Europe. I think okay, Tim, Tim Bay was an interesting guest wait, here. Wait a second, uh, yeah. Tim first, he, yeah. Yeah, I think also, uh, you're, you're, you're complaining about large corporations. Um, now, there's, of course, not only large corporations out there. There's also small ones. There's also people who individually uh, seek to get remunerated for their creative work. Um, the issue is, I think, also, or a thought, the thought I have by hearing your remark, when hearing your remark, is that it's not in the interest of you know, these large corporation or anyone who is distributing a copyrighted work to, you know, not distribute it, to sit on it, to lock it up and have nobody listen to it or watch it. Uh, the, the industry, if you wish, and the drive is to create it and to make it available. The, the, the question is, can you earn money with your creative uh, product? So. The, the industry wants the information to be free in the sense that you can obtain it, but they also want a remuneration for it so that they can pay for new work to be created. That's the principle. So it's not to lock it up, but to get payment. I'd like to uh, add to that, that we indeed shouldn't frame the discussion in terms of faceless corporations screwing us over, or however romantic that may sound. I mean, the same phenomenon you see in agricultural policy, where you have very happy to have voting blocks being the farmers. So I don't like to put it that way. On the other hand, what Tim says is we would like to make things available. That reeks of, of hypocrisy, given the the fight the uh, content uh, industry is putting up in, in making all the works digitally available. I mean, I can ha don't have access to the back catalog of most large uh, record companies through a uh, legal download service. At least now it's changing, but it took them about 10 years after Napster to come to the realization that the digital area is there. It's a bit slow on the uptake. I, I personally, I'd love to pay, uh, you know, maybe somewhere in the area of 50 to 100 euros per month to be able to, you know, get all the stuff I now get anyway without paying for it. Um, if that means I never get, you know, uh, compared again to people robbing ships at sea. I mean, that, I think, 
you know, if, if that means that I never have to worry about any of those issues again, and we can also dump the levy on a certain media in the Netherlands and a couple other countries, I think that would be a good solution, but actually it's not a solution that is offered to me. Okay, let, let's, let's go to, to, a, to a second. Do you have a, please um, ask a different kind of question so that we don't get uh, to repeat ourselves. Okay, well, let me, instead of asking a question, make an observation or two. Um, I think it's really scary if we, if we move to one end or the, the opposite end in, in this debate, either where everybody copies everything and the content creators can't do anything about it, or the other end where the content creators get to control everything in perpetuity and can push a button and the book uh, disappears from my, from my book reader, that kind of stuff. And as an author, not a faceless corporation, look, I have a face, and I actually get royalties. I paid for my trip here with the royalties from one of my books. So I get royalties. And now for some strange reason, if 30 years in the future when I'm old and gray and I'm, I'm, I don't have a pension because I was writing books, I didn't have a good job that built me lots of pension. So if the book still sells, um, would it be fair for uh, the people that sell the books, the, the stores, the government with the VAT, the publishers, the printers, everyone, to make money off of that book? But I wouldn't get anything because the copyright has expired? I don't think that's fair. Well, copyright will not have expired, uh, certainly not before you will have died, but uh, anyway. So, do, do uh, you have a, yeah? so, so you, in order to create those books, you use lots of knowledge that was given to you by a society that spent, you know, several 10,000 years building up that knowledge. Um, you don't have to pay many, most of those people who figured out, you know, how to do all the things that makes it possible for you to even learn to write and write and have a house and, and so there's, there's, there's a ton of knowledge that makes your life possible, and you get that for free, essentially. Um, so then why is it that we need to protect your knowledge? I'm, 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 I'm not saying I want to abolish copyright. I'm saying you know, protection into perpetuity might be a bit ridiculous, given the, the amount of knowledge that you have gotten for free from a society. I'm, I'm a technology consultant. I can't write a report and then live off that for 50 years. I have to write something new every month. Otherwise, I don't get paid. And, and by the way, be, being able to, uh, to uh, travel to this country uh, based on your uh, royalties is quite a feat because, uh, for instance, most, uh, most musicians get uh, you know, a paltry amount of money uh, for their creations. Uh, in, the, in the UK, it's, it's known to, uh, to be on average 20 pounds uh, a year. So I don't know if that stimulates. But anyway. Sorry. Uh, no, I'm, I agree with um, the person who asked the question. The thing is, is that this stuff is made available. It's made available either by a book publisher or it's made available on the Pirate Bay. And these people are making money with it. The Pirate Bay is making money with the fact that these works are made available via the Pirate Bay. You can find them there. They're making money of it. And it is totally unreasonable that an author should not share in that money. I think I... Yeah. I well, may start to congratulate the gentleman with the fact that he is earning royalties, which puts him in the bracket of about only 5% of the authors which really get any royalties out of what, out of what they create. Uh, if you frame the discussion in terms of fairness, uh, is it fair that the automobile manufacturer who made a car, which Tim says you wouldn't download, or you wouldn't steal one in his, his uh, sponsored uh, TV adverts here in Dutch television, uh, that 70, until 17 years, uh, 70 years after his death, he will be still getting money from making that car, uh, which he can't enjoy having because he had sold it ages ago, whereas the creator of a book, which can still enjoy the book he wrote, uh, his descendants uh, still can uh, earn royalties over that. Uh, there's a disparity there. and. At the end of the day, you probably never get to an agreement what is really fair or what is not fair, but you can prove what, will, what is an incentive for people to write books. Okay, let's, let's go to... Yeah, please go ahead. Um, how can it be that if there are such large um, uh, penalties on downloading music, that nearly everyone is still using LimeWire to download music? How can that be? How you, how you try to fight LimeWire? 
Sorry, I didn't hear your question. Sorry, could you repeat it? Um, um, uh, how Why are so many people still using LimeWire to download music? That's the question, right? Yeah. Uh, so given that the penalties are so high. Why, why are they still doing that? Why yeah. Probably why? because it's free. Because it's free and because um, you know, making the rules stick uh, is a lot of work, right? Well, you know, if the, if the LimeWire were in, in Holland, of course, we would have solved that problem already. But it's in the United States and litigation is pending there. Uh, I would say that uh, at the end of the day, it also boils down to the feel. It doesn't make you feel as bad as robbing an old woman from her back will be on the street if you download this song. Um, all right, but um, uh, how do you try to fight LimeWire? Do, do you go to houses and break in and then uh, go on their computer and see the, the day of LimeWire and then you arrest them? Or how do you try to fight it? Now, basically, you know, I personally believe that uh, you shouldn't really uh, impede people's freedom. So, you know, I'm not in favor of uh, what you're saying, hey, go to individuals, people's houses, and, and look at what they're doing. But, you know, people who want something on the Internet, they go to places on the Internet, websites and web services, where they get access to that stuff. And those places are really the new shops. Um, that's where people get access, and it's all about access. Now, those are the central points, and those central points have a, dis uh, have a responsibility, just like a bookshop or a record shop has a responsibility. And that shop on the Internet should uh, take care that its shelves, so to speak, are clean, and that is how I propose to enforce copyright on the Internet. Uh, I get that they have a re responsibility, but what do you actually do about it? What do we do about it yeah, or what they do you, about it? You know, you, your, your brain corporation, um, uh, how, and how does it um, uh, fight those things? Because I know that they have a responsibility, all those uh, companies, but mm -hmm. what do you fight? How do you fight it? Do you um, uh, arrest um, uh, the, the guys that host the LimeWire or the sites that, where they can download? I, I think no, we are we're a private foundation. We use uh, civil law means. So basically, we uh, write to the website owners. If those owners are anonymous then, and, and do not react, then we uh, basically go to the hosting providers and get the site closed down. Uh, but if the owners of the site are uh, traceable, then we will approach those owners and we will uh, discuss with them what they can do. Uh, but if, they, if their site makes structural use of the availability uh, of illegal content uh, uh, out on the Internet, uh, then they will have to take measures. We can discuss with them what those measures are. But if they don't take those measures, we will force the site to be closed down. So we take in the end, if there's a conflict, we can resolve it. We take civil uh, litigation as the judge to, uh, to issue an injunction against that side. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let, let's go to the, um, and maybe you can talk afterwards uh, if you want to, uh, into those details. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? Yes, um, I have a couple of questions and observation. First one that popped up to Mr. Tim. Uh, you said that uh, the Pirate Bay is making a lot of profit from distributing copyrighted works. Can yeah. you please tell me where that profit is? Because I'd like some of it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would say you tell me. You're here. Somebody paid for your trip. Yes. Um, I, I paid for this trip by developing computer software. Sorry? I paid for this trip by developing computer software for my customers. Mm -hmm. uh. yeah. Well, everybody knows, including yourself, that you're selling uh, on your website uh, advertising space, and people pay you for that. And um, uh, in Sweden, an investigative journalist has looked into uh, what your site is earning, and they've basically uh, discovered uh, that you make already in the Scandinavian countries hundreds of thousands of kroner. Well, and besides, uh, somebody is also offering to pay you about, what is it, six or seven million for your site? 
So, uh, well, uh, about seven, including shares, but uh, that, that doesn't prove the site is making a profit since, uh, take YouTube, for example, it has never shown a single cent in profit, and despite that, it was sold for several billions of dollars. Yeah. Okay, you made, you made your point, I think. Yes. Um, and uh, to, the, to the guy to the left, I don't The sound is rather poor. C can someone fix that? Or? The guy to the left, I don't remember your name. You, you well, said that uh, uh, you wouldn't cry if the pirate bay disappeared, but uh, that it has, uh, has uh, proven a point that it has shown that there is a problem. And I totally agree with that. The, the point of the pirate bay has n never been to, to exist uh, forever. Uh, but uh, the the problem now is that we more or less have a have a stalemate in the in the situation. I mean, the pirate bay is not going away, and the uh, anti copyright mafia is uh, not going away. So, uh, so we have to. Actually, have I to, disagree have to find on that with you. Allow me to disagree with you. Yeah, that's, I, that, I think that's on the boundary of be, of being impolite, right? Okay. I, I I'm I'm. <laughs> Allow me to disagree with you. I'm I've quite strongly on an opinion that the current distributors, and I mean the record and film industry, I'm not talking about the creators, but about the distributors, are being swept away and becoming more and more irrelevant by digital distribution. So this stalemate will end. It won't end in a year. It won't end in, in 10 years. But in a few decades, it will all be gone. At least the distribution companies will, be, will have to be transformed. They're just dinosaurs struggling to stay alive in a world where, where the mammals are taking over. Exactly, but how is the current situation going to, going to develop, in your opinion, in the, well, in the I, next couple of years or so? I'm afraid you'll be, you are going to be crushed in, 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 in the process. <laughs> As, yeah, that's, that's one sad of the in itself. Uh, at, at the end of the day, the reason I said I wouldn't shed a tear over it is I, I'm not going to disagree with Tim that the Pirate Bay was facilitating or is facilitating, and I have participated in that, I'm rather sure there's still some bitter and client running at home right now, in, in Walsall copyright infringement. And you cannot expect a lack of any reaction to that. You have been playing with fire and you're, you're getting your fingers burned. And in, maybe a lot more than you would have expected or anyone else would have expected, but you have been playing with fire near to a, a pile of, of explosives and it's blowing up in your face right now which is not nice to, to happen well, to you. Well, at, at least in Sweden uh, the, uh, people have been listening to Aryan's advice uh, to, to vote uh, on a political party uh, that, has a, that is campaigning uh, on the, this piracy uh, issue or this, this, this copying issue. So that's at least uh, one thing that they have uh, no, listened a, to. Yeah? Just to make a point, uh, I'm, I've been following the whole Pirate Bay case with interest but I think for the bigger picture and for the sort of how this all turns out in 10 years, 10 or 15 years from now, it doesn't really matter that much. I think in 25 years, we'll have a repeat of the conversation that uh, an American army colonel once had with a Vietnamese army colonel. They met each other in the mid 80s and the American colonel said to the Vietnamese colonel, you know, you guys never defeat us in battle. And the Vietnamese colonel said, that is true, but also irrelevant. And, and so, 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 so the point is that um, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense gave us this really cool machine, which primary function seems to be to copy bits and then slap them around the planet. And it works really, really well. Um, and so copying bits is never going to be harder than it is today. It's only going to be easier and cheaper and faster. So I think the end point of this discussion is given that development is pretty much set. And then, you know, the question is, how do we take care of artists who we don't want to starve? That's an interesting discussion. But the fact that everything eventually will be available, uh, you know, in a flash on any device anywhere on the planet, I think in the slightly longer term, that's basically a given. And may I add... <laughs> yeah, I... I, you know, just to be sure that you know, I agree completely with that, you know, because that's not the issue. The issue is not to lock it up. The issue is 
uh, for people to create, for, to, uh, for, for, for that to make, to make available and to create a system, to have a system whereby those creators can be remunerated for their work because that's, you know, that is what is reasonable. That is in essence what copyright is about. And the essence is not that you decide that it's be given away for free. The essence is that a creator can be uh, remunerated for the work they have created. You know, and of course, a balance needs to be, fine, but be found, that, and we are in a shifting situation. Nobody will disagree with that. May I add to that? Uh, I'm currently in the process of reading a dissertation from 1909 on copyright law in the Netherlands and uh, abroad. It's, it's, it's available on archive.org because it's not out of copyright over here in the Netherlands yet. And funnily enough, every argument that has passed in the past 40 minutes over here is already in that book from 1909. Basically, we haven't managed to add anything to this discourse in, over the period of a century, which in itself proves that the current system is broken. Yeah, or it's very good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, to me, it also indicates that uh, the, the copyright law wants to do uh, a number of different things that need not necessarily be reconcilable. But maybe we can move to the, the next... Uh, Just a quick final question to... Uh, very quick, Tim. because we have a long mm -hmm. line. Yeah. Uh, will you appear in Swedish court to answer a lawsuit against you and your organization? Uh, which, which lawsuit would that the be? The defamation lawsuit. And what is the defamation? About certain claims you made in the press about... Uh, us uh, DDoSing your website. No. What, okay, well, you know, just between you and me and this audience here, what I, said, what I said is that the DDoS attack on our site uh, happened two days after uh, the press started, uh, after we subpoenaed you basically via Twitter, amongst others via Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and, you know, our site has been under attack numerous times. Uh, and always after there was a high-profile case. So now this happened after we had subpoenaed um, uh, you and, and, and your partners. Uh, so what I said was, you know, this, of course, these are people, uh, fans, supporters of the Pirate Bay. That is what I said. And that is what I think. And yeah. you don't think so? Well, you didn't use the words fans or supporters. Well, that's, you know, this is what I said and this is what I repeat. And by the way, your friend, one of your friends, um, you know, responded to our subpoena by saying uh, that we were remnants of the Hitler Jugend, neo Nazis, and people who had gassed Jews. So if we are. Uh, Okay, if we, points if we, are made here. Uh, if, we, if, we are, if we are going to fight, let, let's fight about what the real issue is and not this fringe stuff, you know? Okay, next, next, next question. No, 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 you've had your final question. I'm sorry. We're going to move to the... <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, yeah. Hi, thank you. I, I'm here from Hollywood, California, where among other activities I make independent films. And one of the main focuses, one of the main focuses of what we try to do in making independent films is reducing the cost of it so that we can actually make money on them. Um, we've gotten it down pretty far. I mean, these Sony three chip cameras here are a couple thousand dollars. You can put a, everything you need to do in a movie studio, editing and all that in a notebook. Um, and the main cost is just the human effort at that point. Um, so I'm, I, I look at this conversation with a great deal of interest um, because the model is changing and we're looking to see what it's going to be and I'm looking to you guys to come up with some of the insights of where we're going to put the turnstiles to get the people to see our movies because we'd love to have a million people see them, we'd love to have a billion people see them. Um, and we'd love it to be as inexpensive as possible to, in order to make the money, in order to make more of them because that's what we like to do. If you want many people to see your movie, the best way to do it is to put it on Pirate Bay, actually. <laughs> I, I'm sure they're already there, but the, the point is that doesn't pay us, right? So we don't make another one. Well, but may, maybe if uh, I could download your movie in a very nice high quality from Pirate Bay or wherever in a format that suits me. Um, 
and then you have a website with a little PayPal button, and I can just do ping eight euros. Because if you make a fun movie and I enjoy watching it with a bunch of friends on my HD Beamer with my Hex Apple TV, then I'd be happy to pay eight euros. But you have to make it easy. What you propose is actually very simple and easy, and I think there will be companies that will facilitate that, and I think things like YouTube or one of the other ones will probably do it for us. Um, but the, the copyright issue is also something we struggle with in the filmmaking process because we have to do a tremendous amount of research in order to find out what we can do without getting sued. And if we do make any money, if we get a million people to pay us eight euros, then we're going to get sued, guaranteed. So actually, copyright is hurting you a lot more than it's helping you. That's an interesting... It, it's both hurting and helping, yes. Yeah, I'm, okay. I, I understand what you mean. And, you know, I'm in favor of a skinny copyright, basically. Uh, and I do believe that there are excesses by which, uh, indeed, uh, you know, companies with capital are overextending um, uh, the rights that they have acquired. And I do believe in the creative process, and the creative process should be sponsored as much as possible. And uh, a balance needs to be found in there so that you can profit from your copyright and not hindered by it. So basically, we only disagree on where the balance should lie. That is, that is absolutely correct, yeah. And basically, you say that we should have 10 years to make our eight years as many times as we can, and then uh, your th kids can have it for free, and then after that or something? But that's what he's saying. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I believe that you as a creator should have, uh, should be able to benefit from the long tail and therefore you should hold your right. And for example, there are movements where um, uh, it said, okay, let's, you know, hire a company that can do the business for you, but after a certain time that copyright reverts to the original creator so you can, you know, re-energize uh, and, 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 and also make new deals. And the funny part is you see that already happening with very successful authors. Yeah, there are big corporations who have successful authors on the contract, but once these authors start, you know, really, well, once they are successful and have more bargaining power, power believe you me, those deals are renegotiated. You know, so uh, there, there is a lot more flexibility than meets the eye. Uh, wait a second, we have a long line of people who want to make an intervention or observation or whatever, raise, raise an issue, uh, and we have 15 minutes left, so I think we have to try to uh, speed a little bit up, okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not allow you to say anything, I'm going to move to the next uh, question if you uh, agree, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm a filmmaker myself, uh, and I want to... Um, ask you all to be a bit more realistic about this whole issue. Um, this guy there was from California, if I understood correctly. In Europe, uh, nearly no single film makes any profit. Um, the films are paid by the government, uh, nearly all European countries, and even very, very big production, which are B productions, uh, if we compare it with uh, US American uh, productions, uh, make losses, like Alexander, for example. So, um, I think, uh, I think that uh, if we in Europe destroy the US propaganda, which is coming here, from the USA, um, we lose nothing. And uh, I think it's quite disturbing when you say, uh, excuse me, I don't know your name, uh, I can't remember it, um, that the single individual and that small filmmakers um, can profit from the laws that exist because, um, like I said, the government is paying for the films. So why and how could I... What, what, what does copyright give me if, if I don't make any money of it? Uh, I really don't understand. Um, and I think uh, that uh, you are only supporting very big companies who have all the power to acquire new uh, copyrights, uh, not copyrights, but yeah, in US they also can acquire copyrights what they can't in the EU. 
Um, so, so what's in it? Your for point me? is your point is clear, but I think, uh, and and you raise an interesting issue about uh, the alternative sources of income for creative individuals and groups, and one is indeed uh, much more stressed in in, in Europe, which is uh, subsidies from uh, either government or private uh, 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 private uh, companies, or uh, well, I, and what is the relationship between those sources of income is maybe a, a thing that you raise in your in your statement. I don't know if anybody ever here goes to, for instance, ballet or the theater or something like that. None of those things, you know, make money. We choose as a society to publicly fund them, and if we didn't, they wouldn't exist. So I don't think necessarily that's bad. You know, maybe we spend too much money on certain things. I, I, I don't know, but it's not bad to publicly fund arts. I'm, I'm, okay, let, yeah, yeah. I'm very much against public funding because Briefly. it it's, it's, uh, breeds elitism and I'm not sure whether, why, uh, why we should um, subsidize classical concerts where, where only the rich people go there. And I would also like to say that there's a certain irony in complaining about the American dominance in this field because the main drivers between, uh, behind copyright laws in the United States were European authors complaining about their pirate copies, especially Dickens, Alexandre Dumas, etc. So if we are suffering from American dominance in that respect, we only have our own historical writers to, add, to thank for that. Yeah, I mean, interesting is, of course, that nine out of ten U.S. films also make a loss. Um, you know, then subsidy, yes, um, that is one way. Um, you have also sponsorship, of course, which again happens by large corporations in general. Um, I don't, I don't think that that. You know what you say is 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 correct, um, and the government that uses subsidies is also earning back um, uh, and and sponsorship. You know that's paying for the funding of these films is also being paid back then by exportation of those films. And so it's e even the government basically you know gets her or, or or these bodies that the government uh, creates to fund. You know, get money, get money back. They just take the risk of making the movie out of your hands when you're subsidized. But I also agree that you know I wouldn't want to live in a society where the government is deciding which films are being made and not. Okay, thank you. Next, next uh, question, please. Yes, uh, this is for the uh, director of Brain. Um, you've made some statements uh, which nobody could possibly disagree with, like. You are for helping the small creator. Uh, he needs to be able to profit from his work. And you've also said uh, that you know, the corporations that distribute it, they only want the money so they can create new content. But what you really haven't done is back that up with facts or examples. Uh, and I would really like you to do that to show that, you know, for example, the big corporations are not just there for making money, or the actual small people are making money because of your work. You know, I was, I was just a couple of years ago, I was in a, in a university giving a college about copyright and so on, and, and in particular enforcement. And one of the guys asked me, like, well, you know, do you get hot uh, about pulling people out of their bed uh, because they made copies? Uh, you know, what is it that makes you tick? Um, and basically, I am answering the question. Yeah. Um, basically the point is many people work in that industry. In the Netherlands, 400,000 people work no, in no, the industry. No, no, I'm asking you, what are you doing? Not general platitudes. What does your corporation do? How does it help the small people? Not in general terms, you know, specifically. How is the content creator helped by what you do? How is it, you know, and how, how does it, you know, prevent uh, abuse by big corporations? You're not answering the question. Okay. We are enforcing copyright, basically by fighting large-scale infringement of copyright. Uh, that means that, that those who have those copyrights, large and small, can exploit their copyrights. That's what we do. Now, how you exploit them, that's your business. OK. 
Okay. Next, next uh, observation question. I have a small example. Five years ago, I copy edited a, a anthology of 20th century American poetry. Um, now, the 20th century, most of the poets that were in this volume are dead, and their copyrights are held by their heirs and successors, literary executors and corporations. And many of these works, which ranged from 20 lines of poetry to 10 pages of poetry, they wanted egregious licenses. And my naive, the naive authors of these works uh, agreed with their major publisher that the license fees would come out of their pockets, not out of the publisher's budget. And in five years, they still have not made on their royalties enough to pay back their licensing fees. For example, the Elliott Estate, for a work that was about to leave copyright in less than a year, wanted a $20,000 royalty for an absolutely essential work of poetry that needed to be in this work. What do you think that, that uh, license holder, that uh, copyright owner should be able to charge any amount whatsoever to license their works? And that copyright should extend beyond the natural uh, creator of the work to their heirs and successors and corporations for so long a period of time that scholars can't, can't use this as a, in an economical way? Okay, thank you. Well, before you address this issue, I think we need to um, collect the, the questions, comments from the line and uh, uh, ask that nobody uh, adds to the line. So these questions will all be uh, raised and uh, you will then uh, respond to those. And that should uh, give us until six um, and then we can end this panel discussion. So thank you for your points. Uh, you, each of the other five also, okay. So why don't you raise your point concisely, you respond, uh, all three of you to these issues and then. Yeah, yeah a point. A question especially for Mr. Tim. In the beginning you said that um, copyright is basically good because I can decide like choosing a Creative Commons license and the, the options that I don't like any commercial or profit use of my work. Um, why don't you accept the fact that um, copyrighted works are available like water everywhere, one time published, and say, okay, if it's just about people and private stuff and not about a company or the goal to raise money. We spare out to have all this, uh, like, you know, what your business is and having all these conflicts and cases uh, in, in law and uh, makes these kind of uh, non-commercial use but in a more public file sharing way uh, as the new balance of copyright. Okay. Next, next one, please. Uh, yes. Well, um, I prefer uh, uh, well new material. Um, we live in a time that I work on a daily basis with people in the United States in milliseconds of time. And when something new comes out, I'll take, for example, Firefly. Uh, I would like to see that now. So here I am with my money, and there it is in the States. And if I want to order it or get it, I get limited. They say, no, there's no law for it. There's no distributor. Why can't I spend my money? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is a question for Mr. Tim Kuyk. I see this opportunity finally ask you a question whenever I'm reading uh, about you in the paper. Um, you're a private company, so that makes you not a law enforcer, but a, a more collection agent, right? Well, that's because you're a private company, I see you that way. Um, shouldn't it be, if an organization like this exists shouldn't be a governmental organization so everybody who votes you know can influence the company because you're a private company and well add to that a question how much I think you know of how many of the lawsuits you uh, addressed you threatened people by um, uh, saying that you were gonna sue them and that they had to pay up front how many of these lawsuits did you win it's a second question the, okay, and the final observation from the floor. Yes, please. Um, I can't remember who it was, but one of you mentioned that you want a new and flexible copyright. When are we going to see a major uh, studio release at work under the Creative Commons? Okay, thanks. <laughs> now I, I'd like to ask you to take, uh, especially these five last people, people's comments. Uh, but also reflecting on what has been said during this hour to wrap up uh, this panel. So, uh, Arjen, why don't you start? Okay. 
Well, let me just uh, quickly respond then to the last question. Um, I think we're already seeing, even in the, with the major studios, that uh, the financing model for making sort of large movie productions uh, is moving away from the classical, we make it, then people somehow pay for it through movie tickets or DVDs, and then we make the money back. It's moving from that to things like product placement and merchandising and other things. So you're seeing that new revenue streams come in existence, and I could imagine that what is already happening with other things like, for instance, books, which are you know, given away full text without DRM at the moment of publication, could also happen for movies where there's so much to watch on the planet that what somebody who makes a beautiful movie, which is financed by product placement, we can think of, for instance, the latest James Bond movies, um, actually just wants people to view them because that's how you make your product placement back. Many people see it. And then it might become logical to just stick it on a Creative Commons license and say, hey, here, you can download you know, the full 8 gigabit Blu-ray glory of it. And that could certainly speed up uh, you know, the number of um, places. The, the, the one other point I would like to make, and this goes back to, uh, goes back to books, uh, I think there is a big sort of, I don't know, breakdown in thinking uh, about the fact that in order to make money, you need the work to be copyrighted. And so two of my personal favorite authors, uh, Charles Stross and Cory Doctorow, they provide most of their books uh, full text without DRM to me uh, at the date of publication, yet I still will buy the book. In fact, I'll buy the hardcover because I know they get paid more that way. Um, and then I'll buy hardcovers to give away for friends. But I actually read it on an e-reader from text I downloaded. So in the whole process, nobody is actually forcing me in any way to give them money. Yet I do it. Why? Because I enjoy the hell out of the books and I want them to write another one. Okay, thank you. So they don't actually need copyright because I like their work. It's another model. Okay. You're being very creative in terms of uh, developing new business models. Tim, want to wrap up from your perspective? Yeah. I mean, I agree with, you, with what you say, except for the last part, obviously. Um, that you don't need copyright. I do believe, you know, the honor system, as you, as you mentioned it, is a great system, but, you know, I don't think that works. Uh, and the internet and what's happening on the internet actually proves that the honor system doesn't work. Um, as far as, you know, um, why are we not a government body? There are government bodies involved in enforcement of copyright. They do uh, criminal law as a... Um, for example, the Pirate Bay knows, so there will be criminal prosecution uh, going on. Uh, we don't do that. We basically defend people's civil rights, uh, ownership rights, intellectual ownership rights, and we do that in a civil way. So we, we um, are paid for by the right owners, and um, we then take civil law procedures. And uh, actually, in my whole life, I had two decisions that were split decisions, uh, and in the history of brain, I've never lost a case for the past 10 years. How many? We have taken several hundreds of cases. Um, you know, I would, have to, I would have to really go and look it up. Uh, hundreds. Okay. Arjen, your final words. Well, Arjen already had his final words. But um, I would like to say, um, if people really are so, uh, care so much about the subject, uh, I would invite them to sue uh, content owners that infringe on their rights because, because of the changes in enforcement of copyrights, the EU can recoup the costs of going to court for that. And I would really enjoy uh, that, uh, to see that happen. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we need to uh, close uh, this session. Uh, it's uh, six o'clock. I think uh, the, the panel has been uh, great. So we have uh, hotly debated things. And uh, I would personally very much like to uh, thank the panelists uh, for that. So, Arjen. Uh, Tim. And Walter. Uh, but most of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank you for participating. So uh, thank you.